Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. This is 40 at 40. I want to start by thanking our guests for joining us today. It's a real honor to be with this group. Men and women who witnessed history up close who fortunately lived to talk about it, and whom I'm sure join me in thanking God and some very talented doctors for saving the life of President Ronald Reagan and the lives of some of those with him almost 40 years ago to the day. We've come together today because the Reagan Foundation and Institute is commemorating several significant anniversary dates in 2021. All of them important reminders that 40 years have passed since Ronald Reagan became America's 40th president. It's a year when we have the opportunity to re-examine his legacy, not just to stir memories of one of America's most admired presidents, but also to introduce him as the remarkably important icon he was to a new generation of Americans. We're calling this year 40 at 40, the 40th anniversary of 40th President's inaugural year. Early in that year, March 30th, 1981 to be precise, history records that we very nearly lost President Reagan and three other souls to a hail of bullets fired by a crazed assassin. Two of those brave souls there to protect the president, whom I'll be introduce in a moment, are with us today. While recovering from his life-threatening injury, Ronald Reagan turned to his personal diary to record the tragic events of the day. In his own handwriting, somewhat still shaky as he recovered from surgery, he wrote, getting shot hurts. My fear was growing because no matter how hard I tried to breathe, it seemed I was getting less and less air. I focused on that tile ceiling and I prayed. As he often did, Ronald Reagan leaned on his faith. Whatever happens to me now, he wrote, I owe my life to God and will try to serve him in every way that I can. That he did. We're joined today by four extraordinary witnesses to this history. Former United States Secret Service agent Ray Shattuck, the agent who risked his own life and shoved President Reagan and his fellow agent Jerry Parr into the presidential limousine. Former United States Secret Service agent Tim McCarthy, who risked his life as well to save the president and dove directly into the path of a bullet aimed for President Reagan. Former White House advanced staffer Rick Ahern, who helped save White House Press Secretary Jane Brady's life with his quick reactions that day. And former White House speechwriter Mari Mossing Will, who having drafted the speech the president delivered that day, was walking just in front of the president when shots rang out. Our conversation will be moderated by Del Quinton Wilbur, currently enterprise and investigative reporter at the LA Times Washington Bureau and best-selling author of Rawhide Down, the near assassination of Ronald Reagan. It is, by all who have studied it, the best written account of that fateful day. 
Let's get the conversation started. Dell? Thank you very much. It's um, great to be here. I've been doing a bunch of talks lately about this day. Whenever we approach an anniversary, um, people reach out to me to discuss the ins and outs. And it's extraordinary that I got to interview all four of our participants for the book and also how much detail one day can have in it that I can't keep it all in my head now 10 years later. Like there are things I forget left and right. There's so much that happened and people perceive this day to be, oh, Reagan got shot, he was winged, you know, he lived and they move on. But there was so much drama and behind the scenes, life and death struggle that day um, that I'm hoping we get to explore. And I, and I think I'd like to kick it off, if, if it's okay with you guys, by, by turning this to Mari Will. And I'd like to know, Mari, you know, you wrote this speech, which when I went to the archives myself to research it, I found that Reagan rewrote the top of it in his own hand that weekend. And it's an otherwise routine speech to a labor union. And if you could just talk about a bit, a little bit about Reagan's biography so our viewers understand it, and, and why this speech was important to him and why he would labor over it you know, to tweak something that these speeches they give like what, twice a day presidents give these speeches? Well, a big speech like that, maybe two or two times a week. Yeah. He gave lots of remarks during the day. Um, this speech uh, was important to him personally because uh, I think as he said right after the opening joke, which he came up with, <laughs> um, that he's the first president to hold a union card. So he felt a lot of affinity with uh, the labor unions and his struggles as uh, working for the motion, uh, representing the actors in California uh, and their union was, was formative in his uh, political philosophy. And he wanted to be able to talk to the building and construction trades uh, people and win them over to our side which was part of a campaign to win support for uh, reducing the footprint of the federal government on American society through cutting the budget. It wasn't just about saving money, it was part of his deep philosophical uh, view, uh, which was why he, he loved Samuel Gompers, which is a, another story of that day, but, and, and he quoted him in the speech. And the building instruction trays were a somewhat conservative um, organization had conservative membership. And so the strategists of the White House thought we had a good chance to bring these people over to support what we were going to do. And Reagan just felt like, my gosh, I can identify with these people. I want to give a, the best speech I can to try to win them over. Now, wasn't this your first big speech that you got to write for the it president was. of the States? Now, can you just describe for our viewers, like, you're writing for one of the best communicators in political history. I would have been sweating. I'm just wondering how did you how did you go through that? I was uh, I was so excited to have the opportunity, and so in awe of the president because I had seen, I'd written lots of uh, more brief remarks. For example, uh, the welcoming ceremony for Margaret Thatcher when she came over. That's when it first hit me. And I was listening to him deliver, my gosh, I know what the president's going to say next. You know, so yeah, it is a big deal. And when you're sitting in front of a typewriter, which that's what we had then, typewriters, uh, you sort of try to channel how the president would say it, what his tone is, what his choice of words would be. And there's a lot of reading that goes into that. And, and so you, you do the, the best you can. And at that point, that was the first time I realized that when the president cared about a speech, he would edit it more than usual. There's, as you said, there's a, there's a wide, a large volume of uh, remarks across his desk. But when something really is important to him, he'll spend a lot of time with his yellow pad and, and writing on the, the margins of a speech. And he did that with this one. And uh, it, was, it was so important to him that uh, I had inserted uh, a Gompers quote because I knew that he loved Samuel Gompers. And that morning he was going over it for the last time and he decided that the quote was wrong. 
and that was back in the day when it was really important to have everything be correct, and uh, especially for the president. And so we had a huge, uh, re not huge, but we had a significant research staff that checked every single dot and tittle. And um, as was my want, I came in just a tiny bit late that day. And the president, when I got to the office, the president had just called over and saying, I want to talk to the speechwriter. I want to talk to the speechwriter. Everybody's going crazy trying to find me. I walked in, Ken Kachika said, let's go. And we went running across West Exec Avenue. He made me race up the stairs instead of taking the elevator. And we sort of semi burst into the president's office. I was out of breath. And, uh, and he, he was holding his cards, his speech cards and his little file of quote cards. And he said that the quote was wrong. And I being young and, you know, confident was about to tell him he was wrong. And Ken said, no, 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 no. You never tell the president he's wrong until you're absolutely sure. So we went back, checked it. Turns out the quote was right. He gave in. And that was the little drama that I experienced that morning getting ready for the speech. Sounds like some recent occupants of the White House could have used some good fact checking I, of that magnitude. Oh so my I'm goodness. not going to get into politics. This is about <laughs> Mark so, so we're going, he's going to the Hilton Hotel. The speech is at two o'clock, the Washington Hilton Hotel. People may not know our, our viewers. Um, it was built to be this big convention site and was built specifically to get the president of the United States to come because otherwise, your hotel is nothing in DC if you can't have the president there. So Rick and Ray, if you guys could talk a bit about one, what goes into planning an event like this at the Hilton from a political perspective? And like, you know, um, you know it's, a, it's a routine speech, but at the same time, it's a big deal. And, and Ray, that the, the security of it, that, you know, when I interviewed uh, Jerry Parr, uh, God bless him, he passed away in 2015, the lead agent on this. Um, he said the, you know, we, we're not, you know, Reagan was shot this day. We're not going to, we're not going to have any spoilers here, right? We all know he was shot. Um, said it, complacency was a major flaw in what happened. If you guys could start with Rick and then go to Ray, because they're kind of interconnected, these two thoughts, I think. Well, sure. Um, my position that day was as the lead staff representative, advanced representative. And when you're the lead on a presidential trip, regardless of who the president is, you coordinate the activities of a number of different agencies. Ray can speak specifically to the Secret Service, but the, we had a site lead from the Secret Service by the name of Bill Green, and I knew Bill from the campaign. Um, and uh, we also had a press advance lead, uh, a White House Communications Agency lead, uh, who's responsible for the lighting and sound and uh, communications establishment of telephones and things of that nature. And you're absolutely right, this, uh, this hotel was built uh, with a presidential entrance uh, at a special presidential holding room uh, at the foot of a flight of stairs and at, at the bottom of an out small elevator um, on the stage right backstage side. And um, we uh, had all worked on the, on the president's campaign, pretty much everybody except the White House communications representative. Uh, so we, we had certain uh, protocols in, in place in terms of rope lines and the distance uh, from the limo to the rope line where the general public could stand. Uh, and uh, what the, we, we did walkthroughs as to what the president's route would be specifically upon arrival uh, to the holding room, from the holding room onto the stage, back to the holding room, and then from the holding room out to the limo once people had an opportunity to get in position um, and how we were going to transport him by the elevator, which was very small. We would not use it in the future. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much the logistical aspect of it. Uh, we had public standing outside behind ropes and stanchions. And again, that was the protocol at that time. Things have changed, uh, but uh, that's the way we did it then at an agreed upon distance uh, from the limo door when the, where the limo would stop and the president would emerge from the limo and the route he would take through the presidential entrance, which at that time was uncovered and into the hotel. Um, I should let Ray speak now, I think. Yeah, yeah Rick, thanks. Um, I look at this as teamwork, obviously. I mean, between Bill Green, who was the uh, Secret Service advance and, and you, uh, 
And I must say that we had an excellent working relationship uh, on the detail with, with the uh, political side of it. And uh, it makes everybody's job a lot easier. But Bill Green would be the one that would go around the ballroom and check every little nook and cranny and every entrance and exit. And, and uh, being at a lunch, uh, the food service, uh, uh, just myriad, myriad uh, things that you can imagine uh, dealing with hotel and hotel security issues. Um, and a lot of that that Bill Green learns, he calls and, and briefs me on it so that I'll know exactly what we're doing and if there's any, any problems. Uh, we, we depend a lot on our intelligence division as well to provide any information about anybody that might uh, uh, be a threat to the president or attending the event that, that could conceivably be a problem. Maybe somebody in the hotel, you know, it, it, goes, it goes very deeply. And Timmy, you might want to chime, chime in on this uh, as well if you've got any thoughts, but uh, it's very involved, uh, a, a tremendous amount of detail. Like, Timmy, what I remembered um, in doing the reporting for the book was each of these events has like a book that thick security book, right, that you're going through. And Green took it off the shelf for the last visit and, you know, basically laid it out because he'd been there a hundred times, right? The Secret Service had taken the president to this hotel like a hundred times. It's pretty routine, this hotel, right? If you were if you were going, like Jerry Parr told me, if you'd been going to Boston or Baltimore or some other city where you hadn't been there a lot, it would have been more from scratch, right? You would kind of rely on the work of the guys who come before you. Uh, from a staff perspective, we, we did rely on things that had, had been done before. Uh, this was President Reagan's first visit to the Washington Hilton. Um, so we relied heavily on, on previous practices. For example, we put President Reagan in the elevator. Um, as you walk in the presidential entrance on the street level, it's a, again, as I mentioned, it's a very small elevator. I think it would accommodate maybe three people. And there's a flight of stairs that's, that goes down right next to the elevator. We brought him down to the holding room, to the stage level on the elevator, and we brought him back up on the elevator. And as it happened, Dell, I remember discussing this with you when we spoke before, um, Dave Fisher was the personal aide to the president. And uh, he, he said, uh, hey, Rick, let me talk to you on the way out. And so we walked up the stairs together and came to the conclusion that it didn't make sense for somebody as, uh, as healthy as Ronald Reagan to be using this tiny elevator and be separated from the doctor and the military aid, et cetera, and from the bulk of his agents. Um, and that in the future, when we, we anticipated doing other events at this hotel, we would walk him down the stairs and walk him up the stairs. So as, as Ray mentioned, there is a great deal of attention to even small detail, like do we walk or take the elevator? I mean, it's only one floor. So uh, well, you're I think, absolutely right. I think what I'm getting at is like the average person today, looking back with 40 years of hindsight, would be shocked that there was a rope line with people behind it who hadn't been gone through magnetometers, hadn't been screened by the Secret Service, a mix of press and just average spectators. And the reason it was there was because that's always where it went, right? It became so routine that people weren't thinking about, oh, we need to reevaluate this in a climate today that we can't have people 15 feet from the president without going through magnetometers. I was fortunate enough uh, to travel on Air Force One a couple of times when I was at uh, Bloomberg News and, you know, Obama approached rope lines, you know, and to, to get into that area took me a good hour, you know, and I was approved, like I had a badge and all that stuff. So do you think that played a role in why that rope line was there, Ray and Tim? Well, Del, let me start out that the, uh, the protocols that were in place 40 years ago, yes. uh, of course, are not in place now. And I recall prior to that taking place, and Ray can probably back this up, that uh, the prior administrations had been lobbied to allow us to use metal detectors. It was not new technology and metal detectors in the hands of, of well-trained people like the Uniform Division of the Secret Service are very, very effective. Uh, so as I recall, we had been asked to use them and I heard such things as, uh, we didn't want it to look like a siege atmosphere around the president. Well. Uh, Ray mentioned our intelligence division. Well, they get sacks of letters every day threatening the president of the United States, whoever it is. Um, so it was a bit of a siege atmosphere. But uh, uh, Bill did pull the plan off, off the shelf. But it always starts with three rings of security to begin with. 
And uh, the second ring now is really the metal detectors where it really wasn't before. And of course, the final ring or the, the agents assigned to the president himself that if all else fails, then you're going to have to rely upon their reactions based upon a couple of theories, which uh, the arms reach theory, that is, if the attacker is within arm's reach, you go for the attacker, and the second to cover and evacuate. And in that case, uh, that those theories did work correctly, that Ray, Jerry, uh, they evacuated the president, I covered the president, and others that were close by uh, quickly took John Hinckley into custody, in spite of the fact he got six rounds off in 1.7 seconds. Uh, that's pretty quick reaction time. So some things worked, some didn't. And we would never say it was a success, of course, because if it was a success, the president wouldn't have been shot. But uh, things have changed dramatically since then. And security is not just is 360 in all directions now. Cybersecurity, of course, is, is more important than it ever was before. So a lot has changed, and I would say mostly to the good. Uh, but I'll tell you what, uh, it's no coincidence. In my view, if you look back at history, the historic assassin has been the lone gunman that gets close to the president. And it's no coincidence since March 30th, 1981, that we haven't had an attack upon the president by a lone gunman. And I uh, credit that to metal detectors being used anywhere and everywhere the president goes. Lessons learned. Now, just, just to follow up on what Tim said about uh, a quick reaction, because if you look at 1.7 seconds on a stopwatch, you can barely get 1.7 seconds on a stopwatch and to think that okay all six of those rounds went off <laughs> from, from the first uh, unfortunately hit hit brady to the last that ricocheted off the, the car in in 1.7 seconds um it's just amazing to me and i attribute our response and i know timmy responded on the four shot in fact i don't i don't know if we have any film at all probably not but but he did. He responded on the, the fourth shot. And I, I the reason that happened is because we had repetitive training sessions at our Bellsville facility, and we call them the, the attack on principle. And we had these drills, and this one was a was a favorite one, the going in and out of the car, the speech sites in these halls, cover, cover, back, make them make a move, get them out of there as quickly as you can. And doing that over and over again. Uh, I'm convinced uh, made it made it somewhat reasonable to say, hey, these guys did respond after the third shot. And, and briefly on this, the FBI, in conjunction with the Secret Service back then, and I don't know where this film is, but I saw the film that depicted the, the scene and in a slow motion phase, it showed shot number one. And you looked at everybody. And now there, was, there wasn't even a change of, of expression on the faces. Shot number two, uh, you could sense some people were, you know, what, what's, what was that? Shot number three, people started to move. Timmy, you know, and, and you talk about heroics. I mean, Timmy, Timmy moved on that four shot, made himself look bigger and, and you know, the rest. Uh, but in, in moving right through until we actually got him into the car. I mean, it was, it was incredible that it was that fast, but it was attributable in my, in my opinion to all that training we did over and over again out of Bellsville. Well, well this gets to my point um, now that we're at the, the shooting scene. It's 2.27 p.m. And like when I give this talk about, um, when I give talks about um, the event, when I say, you know, 1.7 seconds, is a time it takes me to say precisely 1.7 seconds, <laughs> right? I Absolutely. timed it. And that really hits it for people how quickly this was. And if you watch the tape as you're talking about, Jerry Parr is reacting to throw Reagan in the car at about the four tenths of a second mark, which is before his brain can process that there were gunshots, right? I mean, obviously his brain at some level processed the gunshots, but um, this guy uh, did a study of it that I read about, you know, Parr's reaction by frame by frame. And obviously you guys too. And and Tim McCarthy turning to take the fourth shot, which was unleashed uh, less than a second after they had started. Right. That's incredible reaction time. If we could just go through and I start with Mari. 
it's it's 2 27 p.m you're leaving you're leaving the hilton and what i thought would be a dramatic interesting way to get at this each of you gets two minutes to describe what that scene was like let's you know what a minute and a half 90 seconds what you were doing you're coming out what happened and you each had a unique azimuth on this day which i everyone has a different recollection coming at it from a different way and i want you it's going to go mari rick ray and tim well, go when, mari when reagan uh finished speaking i decided to nip out ahead just so not to get underfoot not move with the group and so i was 20 to 30 feet in front of the president going out i passed by the rope line you know, didn't think anything of it. I was almost at my car, or maybe I was at the car, and uh, I heard pop, 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 pop. And it sounded like it sounded like fireworks. I had never been around violence before. I'd never heard much of guns before, and I, I, I didn't know what it was. You talk about the Secret Service agents; they were trained. I was bewildered. Then I saw uh, what was happening, and Reagan being pushed in the car. The Secret Service agent who was driving my car screamed at me to get in the car, and we 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 screeched out of the circle. I had ridden over there with Jim Brady, who was a fabulous guy, well loved in the White House. I was going, "Where's Jim? Where's Jim?" And as we made the sort of little bit of a turn through that circle, I looked out the window on his side of the car and saw him face down in blood. And that just to talk about that right now sends chills through me and is, is very upsetting memory. And I realized what was going on and the radio was crackling with rawhide this and rawhide that. I kept saying what's happening. The driver didn't really know. Uh, and, and we just, we screeched off into the streets, heading first heading back to the White House. Uh, I think because they didn't know how badly the president was hurt. Because I could tell we were going back to the route because the first several intersections were controlled. And then suddenly we took a turn and we were crashing through, not crashing, but careening through Washington, through intersections where people that were not controlled and cars were screeching to a stop. We had to, we got to the, to the Washington Circle and we went, this is the way I remember, we went the wrong way through that quarter part of Washington Circle and so cars are coming at you and like driving up onto the, onto the grass in the circle. And we got to the, the hospital, which was in a slightly different place than it is now. And then we just waited. Um, and that's sort of a capsule of what I remember from that moment. You kept that to one minute and 37 seconds. Nice job, Mari. All Thank right, Rick, go ahead. I don't know if I'll be as good as Mari on the timing, but I'll try. Uh, we emerged onto the sidewalk. The president was right behind me uh, because I was leading him along at, and uh, Ray and, and Jerry were behind the president. Um, and uh, Tim was in front of him. Um, and when the rounds began, it was bang, 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 bang. And I thought there were firecrackers going off, a uh, little, little lady thing of firecrackers going off up in the taxi uh, area, which was above our heads. Uh, and then I was struck in the left eye and in the left cheek by shrapnel from the window from the one of the rounds that hit the hit the left rear window um, and pulverized part of the glass. Um, and uh, I saw Jim Brady go down like a sack of potatoes. He had a pad of paper in, in one hand and a pen in the other, and he didn't even try to break his fall. He just went face first, and I realized that he'd been wounded. So uh, once the limo left, which seemed like an eternity, even though it was a matter of seconds, um, I ran over to Jim and uh, to assess his wounds because I saw that Tim was on the sidewalk, but I knew there was Secret Service there that would look after him. Police officer was wounded. There were policemen who would look after him. And it was my responsibility to look after the staff member who was wounded. And as Mari described him accurately, he was very popular amongst the staff and he'd been a friend of mine since the early 70s. Um, and uh, I saw his wound, he tried to raise his head. He was trying to get up off the sidewalk and the bullet had entered his forehead, uh, struck him in the forehead on the left side, pretty much had opened up his skull. And uh, so I was using my pocket handkerchief to try and hold him together um, until mm -hmm. some medical aid could arrive and provide him with proper bandaging. And we were trying to get him in, a, in, a, uh, in an ambulance. Um, 
once we got him in the ambulance, we had a fight with the uh, DC fire department over where they were taking him. They wanted to take him to uh, the uh, uh, MedStar unit, which I'm sure was their protocol for serious gunshot wounds, but he wouldn't have made it because he had a head wound. And, and I knew from previous uh, experience and training that head wounds, did, you didn't survive very long if you had a wound of this severity. So we had a significant argument in the ambulance about taking him to George Washington, which I knew was the primary hospital at the time, because I always ask the Secret Service uh, on our advanced teams, what's the hospital? I, I've never forgotten to do that since that day. Um, and I saw the limo uh, at the hospital when we pulled up with Brady and I had called on the radio back to the White House to notify the press secretary's office, the president's office, and the advance office what had happened and that Jim Brady had a significant wound. We had no idea the president was, was un, in treatment. I thought when we arrived, perhaps he had come to check on Brady. And then we saw when we walked in, I saw that uh, Dave Fisher and, and Mike Diva, the deputy chief of staff were both on telephone lines and the president was in a treatment room. Ray, I'm giving you a dispensation. You get two and a half minutes. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask for a little bit more time or just get the, get the, uh, the cane out if you need to. Uh, but I wanted to cover just a couple of these things. When I came out of the, uh, the uh, Hilton Hotel, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what happened. When I came out of the Hilton Hotel, I know Jerry was on the president's left. And I was coming up. In fact, I, I think I walked right by Rick Ahern in order to get to that, that right side. So you did. Uh, yeah. And... And so now I'm on the right side and Jerry's on the left side. And we're probably 10 feet from a fully armored car. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, six shots go off in the 1.7 seconds. I mean, boom, 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 boom. It, 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 for whatever it was, it was electricity in the air or something. I, I knew and I'd heard gunshots before, but these were 22. So these were not real loud retort uh, rounds, but hey, it was a it was a revolver. It was a, it was an inexpensive revolver, and he, the guy did a lot of damage with it. But what I wanted to say about Hinckley is, I'm convinced that from where he was, where he was, he had his raincoat on. He had the gun in the raincoat pocket, and what he did, as soon as he saw the president make an appearance out of that toward the car, out of that exit, as soon as he saw him, he pulled that thing out and just bang, 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 and he followed him from right to left. God bless him, uh, Jim Brady was shot in the head. Officer Delahante was shot in the back. The third shot, thank God, went across the street through an office building window. The fourth shot, you know, the, the, our hero, Jim McCarthy, is, that's when he first responded and, and seeing the, 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 the shooting, et cetera, he stood right in front of where the president was and Jerry and I were in that back part as well. The fifth shot now, the fifth shot hit that armored glass on that Lincoln Continental. Thank God for Lincoln Continentals because they had the doors, the old suicide, Rick, you probably remember those suicide doors on those yes. cars. They opened from, from front to rear. They gave us big armored door between Hinckley and the president. And bang, that, that glass, armored glass took a shot. And Jerry, I remember Jerry and I talked a number of times. Who would that have hit? Would it hit me or would it hit you? <laughs> you know, we, we played around with that for a long time. But anyway, um, it did, it did uh, stop that shot. Had we had the Cadillac that day, guess what? The doors would have been exposed. Somebody would have got hit with that, with that fifth round. The sixth round, now, you talk about a fluke. Here's a fluke shot for you. And Timmy, you tell me, <laughs> this, this, this round ricochets off the right rear quarter panel of a fully armored car. And maybe we'll make, we may get into this, Dell, or the, the hospital at some point. But anyway, it picks up black paint and it flattens out about the size of a dime. And as Jerry and I are shoving him in the car, evidently he had his arm out like this, or he, but he caught one under in, in the rib cage, left rib cage, it ricocheted off his rib, uh, and then nicked an artery, which caused all the bleeding. And then it, it uh, lodged in his lung tissue. Now that was a six shot, which, which was just incredible because if you saw how quickly the president got in the car, Jerry, Jerry grabbed him by the shoulders and pulled him down. And, and 
all I can remember is when his head cleared the top of that car, I, I hit him in the small of the back and he, he, he was on the other side of the car. And, and, and you know, I, you had the transmission hub there, you had, uh, you had a fully armored car uh, and there's no soft, soft places on those cars. So later when he was complaining about his ribs, everybody thought, shit, that's what happened. He, he, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. And, and Dale, I don't know if you want to get into what happened in that car. Well, we will. Uh, I think that's later, that, that's interesting, but I'll stop there. Uh, yeah. get, getting him in the car. Oh, by the way, yeah, getting him in the car. And then I'm going to close the door and I'm ready to close the door. And I look down there, two feet down there. <laughs> I had to shove their feet in the car and then close the door. Uh, went to the follow-up car. I saw Timmy on the ground. I saw uh, Brady and got in the follow-up car and, and just announced that uh, there was there was an incident, serious incident. Shots are fired and people were hurt. So I'll, I'll drop it there. So Tim, you hear gunshots and you turn. Take us through what you did and why. How did you do that? Well, let me go back just a little bit. The same team of agents that were there on March 30th, several months before, we were all assigned to President Carter. Uh, and if you worked for Ray Shattuck on his shift, you better be in shape uh, because back with President Carter, a five mile run was pretty common any time of the day or night. So not only was everyone in pretty good shape, but we took our training very seriously. The AOPs that uh, Ray mentioned, we did those constantly. We simulated attacks on, on a president uh, with handguns, with blanks, with flashbangs, with plastic knives and so forth. And your reactions were recorded. I mean, it was, it, they looked to see what you did. So I can't take, uh, as we all know, it was a reaction. And you saw different reactions. If you saw the military aid, he had, did exactly what he was supposed to do and hit the ground. And if he had a weapon, he would have pulled it. Our training was different, to cover and evacuate. And it was a reaction based upon the training without a doubt. Uh, but we train our uh, police to go down dark alleys, our firemen to go into uh, burning buildings and the military to charge up hills. Those are not natural reactions. Uh, so it was clearly based upon training. And I guess what, what I always say, uh, you know, we're trained to do these things, but you never know if you're gonna do it when, when that crisis takes place. So I'm thankful that all of us on that day did what we were trained to do under the circumstances. And we had some success in the sense that the president survived. But again, as I say, it wasn't a total victory because the president uh, was injured. But it was a great team effort. We had a great leader that day, both Jerry Pyre and Ray Shattuck. And you can't do these things without a team. So uh, we'd been together quite some time. had been through certainly not assassination attempts, but we'd just been through a very vigorous campaign with President Carter. So our skills were pretty well honed at the time. So the fact that everyone did what they were supposed to do, I wasn't really surprised at all. It's what I would have expected. What went through your mind, though? The, the gun, gunshots go and you just turn on, on instinct and training. What did it feel like? What were you, you, you took a bullet. Like you're, let's remind no. people, you had a bullet lodged in your liver. I mean, what did yeah. that feel like? Just, were you scared? Were you nervous? Were you afraid? Well, the, the first thing I, I said, I'm sorry to say it was, oh shit. Uh, yeah. You never think it's going to happen to you. Uh, I knew I was hit when, when it when it took place, and actually I was hit in the right chest, and it went down through my lung, liver, and diaphragm, and ended up in my lower back. And at that point, you start to you know uh, I still had my radio on, so I could hear Ray on the radio directing him back to the White House, and uh, um, it sounded as if everything was okay. Uh, moments later, I recall then hearing we're going to the what the Crown was the White House going to George Washington Hospital. Uh, but shortly after that, uh, agents came and took my radio and uh, my weapon and so forth. And I was kind of out of the loop then. And of course, went to George Washington Hospital. So what I always say is I got to George Washington Hospital. It was Tim McCarthy. It, it was uh, Jim Brady. And it was President Reagan. Who got the best doctors? <laughs> and we all got the best doctors and yeah. I, and, uh, I was out of the hospital in about a dozen days and was off for a couple of months so uh, you know my father was a sergeant in the Chicago Police Department and I lived in the south side of Chicago where every other person was a policeman or fireman so injuries on the job were not new to me it was not uh, it was not novel and my father had been injured several times 
but again, Adele, you never think it's going to happen to you. Uh, but the training paid off uh, to a large extent uh, on that day. And uh, uh, I hope I don't have to do it again. And I've worked as chief of police for several mayors. I've informed both of them that don't count on me to do that for you. Just a little quip on this. I mean, do you remember when I came visiting the hospital? Probably third or fourth day. And I, I said, Timmy, I said, what did it feel like to get shot in the chest? That's what I asked. Oh, him. yeah. Do you remember what you said to me? <laughs> well, what I think I remember, it's like a hot ice pick going in. You is, said, is what I recall now, but I, said, tell me. You said it was like somebody taking a baseball bat and swinging it as hard as you can and hitting me in the chest. <laughs> well, and that, I remember that now. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, about 6'2 and weighed 200 pounds then, it was hard to believe that I'd get taken down like that. Um, I mean, I got hit a lot harder playing football at the University of Illinois against Michigan, <laughs> Ohio State and places like that. But I was kind of surprised in the end, looking at it, that it darn near lifted me off my feet. Uh, so, yeah, it was like a baseball bat, uh, uh, the impact of it. Sorry about yeah. your Illini in the tournament. Oh, Dell, I'm sick about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a Northwestern Wildcat, so I have a lot more pain. Um, Ray, <laughs> um, we're talking about the ride to the, to the hospital. I think it'd be great if you could – you've talked to Jerry, you know, um, you described that. Only one thing I want to mention, I interviewed Drew and Rue. He was the driver of the limo that day. And they described right. that, you know, it was such a heavily armored limo when the door slammed shut. It was like utterly silent in that car, the way Jerry described it to me. They're screaming outside, but so thick, he couldn't really hear anything. It's like a being a cocoon. And Drew and Rue slams down the gas and he told me, I was praying to God I didn't run over my friend Tim McCarthy. I know he went down. Because that, that car weighed 13,000 pounds. And, but he still drove, right? He's like, I just pray to God I don't hurt, you know, because he couldn't see you after you fell. And I just remember that very vividly. Like, it was such a chaotic moment. But if you could take us through, like, what happens in that car, Ray? Because, you know, you talked to Jerry about it. Yeah, I, I, I talked at length. We, we talked over and over about that. But uh, when, he, when I closed the door, uh, the first thing he did is went to the president and he said, are you okay, Mr. President? And the president said to him, yeah, I think so. And that's when Jerry got on the air and announced that he was going to go to uh, the Crown or the, the White House. But it was shortly thereafter that the president started to complain about his ribs and kept telling Jerry that you guys hurt me when you threw me in the car. I think he mentioned that a couple of times. And then he, then he, he said, I can't breathe very well. I'm having a hard time breathing. And Jerry noticed his, the ashen color in his face and asked him, you're having a heart attack. And he said, he said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, so Jerry got in his coat, took his coat half off and went around the, the, the entire upper part of his body looking for any kind of a, a bleeding or, or a exterior wound of any kind. He couldn't find a thing. But he looks over at the president and he's got a, he's got a napkin in his hand and he's dabbing his lip. And Jerry could see that there was blood on the napkin. And, and thank God that he followed through on that and didn't think, well, uh, he probably just cut his lip when he was thrown in the car. But Jerry, well, it, was bright, it was bright and frothy, right? That yeah, that, that, that's wants, what, right? That's, I remember that. Yeah. And he and he also used the, the word oxygenated, but Jerry did. Yeah. And he said, when I saw those things, I saw it deep, kind of deep in his mouth and his throat. That's when I said, uh, we're going to GW Hospital. But like us, nobody knew what it was. And, and I'll let you go on from there. Oh, no, no. But you got... You, he goes to the hospital, and and I, what go people hospital, don't get please. is how how often how often um, would there ever be a motorcade with the president that you've ever seen with just the presidential limo? Never, right? Right. Like this happened so fast that car took off, and it took a good minute or two for the to get the follow up car right get you there the armored follow up car right? No, no exactly. And, well, you know, and the and the spare the spare car and. Yeah, I think in the chaos, and that's what's going to happen in a situation like that. You leave people behind. I mean, one of my shift members got left behind. There was no free will. Uh, and then we had uh, one or two others. That, uh, and then we had somebody join us. So, yeah, that that uh, you expect that kind of thing uh, in, in an attempt so, like that. So Jerry Parr's, or not Jerry Parr, Reagan's life is now saved once because you, 
Jerry Parr and you get him out of the way. He's not a sitting duck. He had a, there was a straight line of sight on him, Hinckley, onto the president. And he's been thrown into the car. By chance, he gets the ricochet. But if you're a second slow, it probably hits him in the head, right? So you've saved him once, life once. Well, that, that's, that's a good point, though. Could just quickly, Jerry, yeah. did, Jerry and I talked about that. If we had been a little slower getting him in the car, he wouldn't have been hit here. He probably would have been hit in the, in yeah. the neck. Head head region. No, that's a good. That's a good. That's a but good but also, if he hadn't moved, he's a sitting duck. I mean, Hinkley took a lot of target practice, right? And the second time, the trip to the hospital, and they get there in three minutes. And I think you pull up. You're there. It, does Reagan like get carried in? How does Reagan get into the hospital? Uh, well, you know, he's kind of a cowboy sometimes. So yeah. he says, "I'm walking in. Don't don't help me. I'm walking in." That's what he said. So. We let him walk a ways. You could see his face was ashen in color, so yeah. you knew something was wrong. But he, he walked hard, but then he started losing it, and then we grabbed him and, and wound up taking him uh, into the, uh, uh, the emergency room. But, but on, that, on that point you were mentioning there, uh, the one thing that came up, and Jerry and I talked about this forever, about what happened if we had gone to the White House first? And... I'm just, you know, we're so fortunate that we didn't do that because uh, that artery was was bleeding. He wasn't breathing well. And if we had gone to the to the White House, where it's obviously going to be more secure, but no no good medical uh, treatment there. So now what do you do? You got five minutes, maybe ten minutes before you you get to the uh, GW. I don't know whether they because if we stop to the White House, what are you going to stop and then take off again? Are you probably going to talk? And, and now you got 10 minutes. Yeah, he, he survived uh, 10 minutes uh, with that bleeding. The ER doctors I interviewed for this said if they had gone to the hospital, if they had gone to the White House, he would have died. Because yeah, so when I they say, put him on the when you put him on the trauma bay table, they couldn't detect his pulse. And when they finally got it, the, the pressure was about 60, which puts him in shock. And he lost more than half his blood that day. He just wouldn't have made it. Jerry, um, Jerry saved his life with that call. If he, he had made the other call, but Jerry he did, did the right thing. He followed up on that blood and, and he saw it. And yeah, anyway. So I want to get back to Mari here. So Mari, you obviously heard. So Reagan, he's shot. He, he doesn't die. It's really dramatic. His life comes in, hangs in the balance of a split second, a split second decision and an inch. That's how close the bullet was to his heart. You know, they race him through, they do surgery. But Reagan's character on this day, right, his actions, his quips, his jokes, um, he sees Nancy Reagan come in and he looks at her and he's naked with a chest tube jammed in his side, draining the blood, right? He says, her, honey, I forgot to duck. And that says so much about the person, right? He's worried about her. Everything was about everyone else. Can you talk about Reagan's character during this process, because you came to know him very well, and what it did for him in the country. Well, um, and and you have as much time as you want to wax about. Okay, this. I think it's I think this is really important. We're, we got the drama going, we have everything, but we need to pull back. I think, and, and why is this so important? Well, I guess a lot of people know by now that uh, Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan uh, were a world unto themselves. Um, uh, they loved each other so deeply uh, and cared about almost, you know, everything else dwarfs in relationship to how much each of them cared about the other. And of course, he wanted her not to worry. She, she was the warrior in that relationship and it played out in many ways all through uh, both terms. She was always trying to take care of him. And so I can only imagine um, the shock and fear and anxiety that was in her. And of course he would know about that. And so to be able to come up with that as you lay near death on a, on a trauma bed is to, it's really unbelievable. I think it's a testament to the love, first of all. But um, in the second place, he's a very tough guy. You know, a lot of his detractors uh, tried to paint him as just a Hollywood type and, um, you know, not very deep. He was extraordinarily thoughtful and uh, had some prime uh, 
some priorities etched in his heart. The first, of course, was Nancy, but the second was the country. He loved America so much. And I believe the reason he wanted to walk is he was a cowboy and he loved it. He tried to practice being a cowboy running up to that point. But um, he wanted America not to be afraid. He wanted Nancy not to be afraid, but he wanted America not to be afraid. He was always conscious about the symbolism of his leadership, not just in what his policies were, but the way he conducted himself. And uh, so, so that, that is really amazing with, I don't, I can't imagine doing that and the physical pain that he must have been in. But just to put a note on that, two months later, after he, um, after he had recovered and he was on a foreign trip, I think it was in Germany, there was a, a car backfired or there's some kind of noise that sounded like a gunshot. And as we've discussed, it's hard to tell a gunshot um, from, any, from other sounds. He immediately reacted in a split second. Oh, you missed me. You know, so he was making a joke. I'm still traumatized about that day, right? <laughs> I can hardly tell the story without tearing up and getting chills. And he says, oops, you missed me. You know, um, and that was also just, an, he was emoting the kind of confidence that America needed. And I have always admired him for that. Um, the... What struck me too about this in interviewing people was, you know, the famous line he gave that day where he got to, gets up on an elbow right before surgery and says, takes off the mask, I hope you're all Republicans and lays back down. And the people took that to be like, you know, he came up with those one liners pretty quick, but he was an astute actor, right? Obviously, 51 movies. I'm sure I'll be corrected by the Reagan Foundation, but I think 51 <laughs> movies, lots of stuff, right? He, and what struck me as interviewing these, I interviewed a couple of technicians, I interviewed Jerry Park. And they all heard him use that line in the ER. He's on the table in the ER and he looks up at Jerry and says, I hope they're all Republicans. Because he's trying to calm people down around him, right? But the joke fell flat. But he puts it in his back pocket and uses it again. And I was wrestling with trying to understand why would he do that? How, then it hit me, his two most famous movies, Newt Rockney, his best scene in that movie, hospital like deathbed scene, and, and King's Row, where he loses his leg, he's in a bed, he says, where's the rest of me? So he knew the value of a good scene, right? I, it's an aside, but, you know, but it gets also this point how empathetic he was, how um, he was always looking out for other people. And that gets to Tim McCarthy. You're getting discharged in the hospital. And you told me one of the most poignant stories about Reagan. You get summoned to his suite upstairs. Tell us what he said, what he did and what it meant to you. Well, it was I was leaving the hospital that day and my wife and two of my children at that time were coming up to get me and my oldest daughter at that time brought her nursing kit with too by the way just to make sure uh, that I was getting the proper care so uh, I don't recall how it was uh, relayed to me but I was requested to come up and see the president and it sounded a bit like an order as you can imagine so my wife and two kids we go up to see the president he's in his room now and we've got six inches of armored glass on the on the windows can't see out much and the president was still, you know, I had the chest tube and uh, several other tubes in me, and he still had several of his in there. So I knew about how he felt. On the same token, he was connected to these machines that were flashing blue and red and doing all sorts of cute things that attracted my children right away, too. And my poor wife and I were both scared to death that uh, they were going to finish off what John Hinckley started by <laughs> playing with one of these machines. So lo and behold, we have a wonderful conversation. The president says, you know, we're going to get together for lunch and dinner and so forth. And, and that sounded, you know, pretty uh, intimidating to tell you the truth. Uh, but we had a wonderful conversation and it was time to go. The kids were getting a little antsy uh, and, you know, the president wasn't 100 percent. So we said our goodbyes and we just about got out the door and the president stopped and said, Tim, hold on a minute. It was uh, McCarthy, Reagan. Delahanty, Brady. What the hell did this guy have against the Irish? And it, it makes your exact point, Dell, that the president was thinking about everyone else. But the way I took it was, uh, you know, it was a critical incident. And after that, I was part of a critical incident response team. But in every profession, in every job, you can go through a critical incident, even in your daily life, if a car crash. The theory behind it, I'm told, is a third of the people who go through a critical incident can never go back to their job. 100% effectively. They're always going to be affected by it. 
Another third may be a minor effect and another third no effect at all. And it was clear to me that it did not affect him in the slightest, uh, that he was ready to get back on the horse, of course, and get back to work. So it was a great example for me. And several months later, uh, I was back on the job as well. And I was uh, working midnights, I believe. Wonderful. You get back from getting shot and you work at midnights. Ray, Way to go, Ray. Ray. Shannon, you should take care of your guys. <laughs> Ray. Make you humble, nice. Tim. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, again, it was the president, Bell, as you pointed out, worried about everyone else. Uh, but he was a great example for me. And I think, you know, uh, through that story for everyone that, yeah, we all go through critical incidents, but, uh, you know, you have to make the best of them. They happen. And uh, so he was a great example for me. So he gets um, the doctors. Uh, we kind of glossed over this a bit, but, you know, it took a couple hours, but the doctors hunted in, in his body for this bullet. And one of the most poignant moments to me on this day was as Ben Aaron is trying to find this bullet to extract it because he's worried it could slip into an artery and kill Reagan, right? He wanted it for that reason. He also didn't want to leave a bullet in the president of the United States. This 31-year-old surgical intern, a nobody, David Adelberg, reached his hand into Reagan's chest, gently cut the president's beating heart in his hand and nestled it aside, and literally held the beating life of the president in his hand to give Ben Aaron more room to look for the bullet. Right. That's like people forget, like how serious this day was, how close he came to dying. A, a guy who had not even been screened by the Secret Service at all was holding his beating heart in his hand. Um, and then he gets through and he and he has his fun one liners with the nurses. Right. All in all, I'd rather be in Philadelphia and these things get out and they form a bond with the American people, obviously. Rick, what you were close to the president, you saw this and Mari. When he came back, I think 11 or 12 days later. And as time went on, how do you think this changed his presidency? And how do you think it changed his relationship with the American people? I know these are big questions. Um, and, and, and how do you think it affected him on a daily basis? I know we said he got past it, but, you know, it affects you. He did say, or he wrote, that uh, uh, he, he was devoting the rest of his life to God because he felt that God was responsible for his survival. Uh, once it became known how severely wounded he had been. And uh, he also, I think Ray would know this better than I, and uh, he also de dedicated himself to his physical conditioning as well. And spent a lot more time working out, strengthening his chest uh, for the remainder of his presidency, I believe. Um, and uh, I, th I think that uh, the most important effect it had on him, and there are people there at the library who, would know better than I about this, but uh, that uh, his relationship with God strengthened significantly. Well, I, I agree with that. And uh, every speech afterward, we always found a, a reason to put God into the speeches because he, he wanted it there. He wanted that to be one of the things that the, the American people knew about and uh, his faith in, in God. Um, but I think also the context of the moment is very important in that um, people forget that when Reagan was elected, the country had a big identity crisis. Um, it had been told that it was sick. You, know, you remember the Carter Malay speech, not to get into politics, but there had been the, uh, uh, the hostages in Iran. There were a lot of things. Uh, the botched rescue attempt, a lot of things we, that were making America question its greatness, its strength, and its stability. And Reagan's election was sort of their hope to bring it back. But when he's shot, it's not too long after he takes office. And is this another in a string of American failures, vulnerabilities? And I think that he knew deep down that he need, he wanted, he almost more than anything, he wanted to show that America is strong, that he's strong, that we're back, that we can overcome almost anything. That was a big part of his persona. Um, and I think it was a, a really important physical body language um, demonstration for the American people not to lose heart with this. And so they rallied behind him. He was overwhelmed with, uh, good wishes and gestures, uh, uh, pray, people praying and hoping for his recovery. Um, 
it ended up instead of being yet another string in American failures, to be, but to be another symbol of the American resurgence. And and Ray and Tim, how did um, how did the Secret Service change after this? It must have been a pretty fraught time for you guys. What changed Rick to the Secret laughs. Service? Rick, Rick laughs, but we probably could have put tanks on the South Grounds after that. Yeah. <laughs> But well, I'm still dealing with the it. Secret Service race, so that's why that's why I'm laughing. Oh. <laughs> it's a different it's a different relationship than it was prior to the 30th of March. We took full advantage of it. How's that? that <laughs> yes, I'd say so. <laughs> because uh, Jerry Parr told me he said um, they put magnetometers up at the White House, and he was utterly astonished at the number of old ladies visiting from the South that you removed handguns from their purses. <laughs> 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 trying to get in because they were afraid of DC and they're bringing these guns to town. He's like, how many guns were walking around the White House for all those years? Well, they caught my young nephews coming into uh, uh, one of the White House Easter egg hunts. Uh, had to meet him at the Northwest Gate with mom, his mom and dad, my nephew, and he walked up. To them, so I went out there and met him. And all of a sudden, he was about 12. All of a sudden, he realized metal detectors. He pulled his pocket knife out, threw it at me. He says, here you go, Uncle Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Smart kid, did he become an agent? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know you can tell. So, but how did then you guys like you like um the Kevlar tents, right? Um, never getting in and out of a car near an unsecured place, like that you're saying, right, Tim? Earlier you said we haven't had really an attempt like this on a president where anyone got close, um, in, in forty years, and right, a lot of things changed, didn't they? Yeah, we ch we changed some policies. Covered arrivals had not been. Uh, had been all actually Ray. I think they were actually frowned upon because if you were down in a garage for a covered arrival, you were kind of, you know, you could be blocked in. So covered arrivals took place. Metal detectors, which I think was the most important, counter assault teams being nearby all the time. And you know, we'd had the experience with Anwar Sadat after his own military turned on him that, uh, you know, heavy weapons and so forth. Sadly, you know, are using these things. So we had a counter assault teams nearby. Uh, Ray will remember we were doing all sorts of studies at the White House on different potential vulnerabilities, getting better um, glass, armored glass at the White House. So a lot of things changed and it mostly changed for the better. But I, I go back to those metal detectors as being the difference that there hasn't been uh, the, the historic assassin has been the lone gunman that gets close. And there hasn't been an incident since March 30th, 1981. And I think Mrs. Reagan had a little bit to do with it, too. I think she exerted some influence to say, listen, it's time to make some changes. No, the metal, uh, metal detectors are huge, just huge as far as security is concerned to be able to. But the, the funny thing is, when we, we were told no early on, Tim, as you remember, yeah. you're the, these are the same people that go to the airport and, and go through the metal detectors to get on an airplane. And yet, yeah. yet, yet they don't want them at the White House. Really? <laughs> Anyway, the, um, they're all they're uh, all in place everywhere. So it just uh, everywhere the president goes. Bill, I mean, yes, I, I, these guys are experts at the security. But just to to give it from the point of view of uh, somebody who's not involved in making it happen, I can tell you the changes started immediately after he was in the hospital. It was twilight by the time they let our cars. There were, I think, four of us in the motorcade still at the hospital that they let our cars go back to the White House. Even the White House cars driven by the Secret Service were not allowed in through the gates. I had to be dropped off outside the gate, go through security and walk my way up West Exec to get back to my office. Everything was in lockdown. Everything was being questioned. It felt like to me, someone who's just a beneficiary of the security, but there was a lot of confusion and uh, uh, uncertainty around in terms of what had happened, what was going to happen, but the Secret Service was taking no chances and it, it, it changed forever in those moments. Um, our time is getting a little short here and I don't wanna have the last word, but I wanted to, to relay a story of why this day was so significant. And then give you each a minute, kind of talk about what you thought was significant about it. Um, in 2011, I gave a speech at the Reagan Library with Jerry Parr. And after we had dinner with Nancy Reagan, and it was very difficult talking for me, talking about this day, I, you know, I get pretty wrapped up and excited about it. And it's very dramatic in front of Mrs. Reagan, her worst day, right? And we went upstairs and had dinner and she turned to Jerry 
and I, I still get kind of emotional about this. She turned to Jerry, gently tapped Jerry on the arm, rubbed his arm and said, Jerry, thank you for giving me my life back. 30 years later, like it was so present for her that moment, right? Um, and I'm just like, if you guys could each take, you know, a minute, 30 seconds, what, what lessons you learned? What, why is it still important for people to think about today? March 30th, 1981. Go ahead, Rick, you start. Well, I, I said this jokingly to Ray a few moments ago, but I'm still involved with presidents and uh, presidential candidates. And uh, the changes that have been made in, in the security aspect are daily, uh, have a daily impact on our lives. Uh, how we set up every event, uh, how, how much earlier the people have to get there. Because we, I did the first couple of events after the shooting, uh, the commencements at Notre Dame and West Point. It was the first time we'd ever used magnetometers for large numbers of people, and nobody really knew how many could pass through each each magnetometer per hour. And we had great debates over those things. Uh, we've got it down to a science now, 40 years later, the Secret Service has. Um, but people have to show up a lot earlier. All those rallies that you saw President Trump doing, people were there for days and hours ahead of time, knowing that they had to pass through screening to get in. So it's had a profound impact on those of us that are still involved in presidential politics on our daily lives. I think about it often. Tim? Well, I think for the Secret Service in particular, um, you know, the Secret Service doesn't protect a Democrat, uh, doesn't protect a Republican. It protects the office of the president. So that the only way the office, the president is removed from office is at the ballot box, or as we've seen, attempts at impeachment. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the major role of the Secret Service and, and what I've always thought about uh, afterwards, that uh, that was our role. Uh, we did a pretty good job that day. I'm not going to say it was a total success, as I've said before. On the same to token, uh, a team of agents did a remarkable job. And uh, I believe, even though he was hit, it could have been, been much worse if everyone didn't do what they're supposed to do that day. And I want to mention uh, Rick Ahern's part of the staff. We've always had, Ray knows it better than I do, a big conflict with the staff. Listen, that inner perimeter, those, that, that team of agents that's in a formation around the president is there for a reason. And we often ask the staff to stay out of it so that we have the room to work. And uh, the Reagan staff was great at that. They give us the room to work. The president's obviously not going to declare war on anyone walking from the hotel to the car. But that's the room we need to be able to do our job. So we had a great relationship at an early time with uh, the president's staff, Rick, and, and all of his folks. And that did help that day to allow us to do our job to help save the president, to have the room. The Jerry and, and, and Ray were right there, no one in between to get him into the car for the rest of us to do what we had to do to cover and evacuate the president. So lessons learned, things went right, things went wrong. Uh, but uh, thank God he did go on to serve two terms as president. The country was better for him. Ray, why do we still need to think about this day? We, we can't take anything for granted. We, uh, and we did learn so much by that one event. Uh, why are people so close? Uh, why don't we have metal detectors? And, and as I mentioned earlier, they, uh, the, the people that were the biggest detractors, all of a sudden, what do you want? When can we get it for you? How much, how much do you need? The armored glass in the White House was a, was a project that languished for a long time until after that. And then that process sped up too. And, and not that that's all we can expect from it, but uh, you, you just tell your people, you know, you do you know don't don't take anything for granted don't go into a stop and say well this is this is the way we do it and this is a, the way it's always going to be done no <laughs> you can be, you can get better you can find other ways to do it uh and washington hilton was no uh, no different mari i'm giving you the last word no pressure <laughs> you know we started with you with the speech let's let's end with you summing up like you know well, why is this day important and and, and what does it mean well, when people take power, when they go into the White House, it's a very heady time. And uh, not that we thought we were masters of the universe, but I think it's, uh, we were pretty cocky in those first two months that the world was our oyster and we could do with it what we would. Um, 
This was a humbling experience, teaching us about the fragility of life and that you, as Ray said, you can't count on the next day. And so to take our days going forward, understanding their value with humility and uh, try to do our best in each and every moment to live up to the possibilities that God has given us, not that we have gotten it on our own. And I think that's what Reagan learned. And I don't know if I learned that from him, but it's certainly my takeaway from that day that um, humility in the White House and uh, the understanding of the fragility of those times um, is all important. Well, I just wanna say thanks to everyone for joining us. And uh, thanks to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation Institute for having us and give us this time to revisit um, this dramatic day, perhaps one of the most dramatic days in US presidential history. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends, and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.